From 20 July to 20 August, the truce talks at Kaesong continued to hold the Korean spotlight, with limited ground combat resulting in only minor changes in the battle line. A small UN offensive above Kum Hwa reduces a red bulge and straightens the Allied line in the central sector. To the east, continued pressure by 8th Army units gains several miles north of Inji and Yanggu. As truce negotiations threaten to break down, UN commanders are alert for any movement by the Red forces, which have been greatly strengthened in men and supplies during the period of the Kaesong conferences. In an action typical of our current hit-and-run tactics, an infantry patrol infiltrates through enemy-held territory in the rugged hills northwest of Inji. Short advances are made into hostile regions to locate red outposts by drawing their fire. Once the enemy positions are pinpointed, the unit maneuvers to concentrate its fire and saturate the area. After inflicting all damage possible on the red positions, the patrol will pull back within its own lines. Near Hong Chon, a communications team gets final instructions before moving out to install another link in the very high frequency radio telephone network. The VHF stations are necessarily located on high ground since the radio beam is limited in its range by line of sight. Mountain tops, high peaks or ridges, though difficult to reach, are the preferred sites. During the last stages of the climb, Pack mules captured from the Chinese communists will carry the heavier, bulkier equipment. Because of its relative compactness and light weight, the VHF radio telephone equipment has proved extremely valuable in combat area communications. It is easily and quickly assembled, and problems created by unusual terrain features in wire laying are eliminated. During operation, a VHF station can handle four telephone channels simultaneously. Receivers and transmitters are carried on A-frames to the site by Korean civilians hired for the trip. Antennas are set up on the highest ground in the site area to obtain the maximum range. When the mast has been fitted together and guy lines attached, it is set into its base and raised into position. The antenna operating on a directional beam is carefully oriented in azimuth. A coaxial cable is connected with the antenna and terminated in the transmitting station located close by. Coaxial cables for both transmitting and receiving pass through the central housing. Antennas for transmitting and for receiving are raised and guide as the installation nears completion. More supplies are moved to the station by an ingenious system of long lines and pulleys, a saving in time and manpower.
gasoline for the generator units which provide the electrical energy for the station, food and water for the crew are all hauled up the pulley shuttle system. The newly activated station is ready to make radio contact with another unit. Messages sent through the radio telephone channels pass from telephone to wire to switchboard. The carrier then separates messages into one of four available channels which are transmitted by the VHF radio. At the receiving end, the messages follow the same channels to reach their destinations in the field, from radio to carrier to switchboard to telephone. After a series of checks and servicing adjustments have been made, the station is considered installed and ready for operation. It provides another link in the very high frequency radio telephone network and will contribute its part to the efficiency of our combat communication system. In spite of the driving July rains and the tough uphill going, American riflemen renew their attack to secure Hill 1179, north of Yanggu. Previous attempts to take the hill have resulted in failure. Fiercely defended enemy positions force the troops to dig in preparatory to an all-out attack. The unpredictable Korean weather has proved to be as troublesome as the Reds themselves. The drive toward the hill is supported by self-propelled 155 millimeter guns. With the aid of artillery spotters and information obtained from patrols, the big guns from this forward position concentrate their fire on known and suspected targets. coordinate their fire in the assault. Surface and air bursts clear the way for the riflemen. Strongly entrenched enemy positions are successfully eliminated from the path of the Allied advance. Creeping barrage, a heavy mortar company joins the assault on Hill 1179 in a continuous bombardment of 4.2 shells. From firmly established positions in a nearby valley, the mortar company supports the attack by lobbing their shells in on the hill just ahead of the infantrymen. C-119 flying boxcars drop ammunition and supplies as the UN unit reorganizes after the hill is taken. Airlift operations are necessary to reach the inaccessible hills of Korea, such as this, whenever supplies cannot be readily brought in by vehicles and other standard supply methods. the peace talks continue and the United Nations line in the north becomes stable, a mob of exhausted, rag-clad refugees swarms back toward Seoul. They gather on the south shore of the Han River, hoping to cross and return to their homes, which they abandoned when the city was last left to the enemy. Not all have returned. Thousands have died from hunger and exhaustion along the road. 
exposure to weather and disease have taken countless others. Most of the refugees must be turned back because of the serious food shortage in Seoul. For the present, only farmers and their families will be allowed to re-enter the city. Military authorities must check the papers of everyone seeking to return. Children, orphaned or separated from their parents in the confusion, shift for themselves. The screening process is a heartbreaking job. Most of these people have walked hundreds of miles to get back and have waited for days to have their papers examined. Those authorized to enter the city receive typhus injections. With the city's facilities destroyed, every precaution must be taken to prevent the spread of disease. As the screening goes on, the refugees who have been processed start for the river. Burdened with their families and the few possessions they have managed to cling to, they plod across the sand to the boats that will take them home. There have been many delays, but for those who have reached the boats, the long journey is almost over. The outlook is still grim and uncertain. The city is in ruins. They will find their homes nothing more than heaps of ashes and rubble. But at least it is hope and a possible end to the months of aimless wandering. The refugees allowed to return to Seoul are fortunate compared to those who must be left behind. For these unhappy people, like thousands of others wandering through Korea today, there is not even the small comfort of a home in the ruins. During a tank infantry patrol north of Yanggu, an enemy box mine puts this allied tank out of action. A crew member is injured in the blast. Cautious probing reveals another box mine nearby, which is carefully deactivated and removed. The men gather materials to aid in bracing the tank as a tank retriever is ordered up from the rear. Mud and rain, the universal enemies of the soldier, slow down the work. The crippled M4 will be hauled back to maintenance shops in the rear, where skilled repair crews will quickly put it back into action. On 27 July at the Kaesong Truce Talks, the Reds agree to an agenda, leaving the question of withdrawal of foreign troops to political conferences. The most important question still to be settled is the military demarcation line. Tape recordings are made of the discussions. British and Australian communist correspondents Alan Winnington and Alfred Burchett cover the talks with the Red delegation. Red propaganda posters appear even in Kaesong. 
With the meeting at an end, General Na Miel and his Chinese colleagues leave to report to their superiors. The convoy of United Nations negotiators returning from Kaesong find themselves isolated when the Ponton Bridge over the Imjin River is washed away during one of the many unpredictable floods in the area. An attempt to rescue an army captain marooned on one of the pontons is made by helicopter. Too weak to hold a line let down to him, the attempt is abandoned and a small boat puts out to rescue him. Personnel in the isolated convoy were airlifted by helicopter to Munsan in a two-hour shuttle operation. As the peace party leaves Munsan for the August 5th meeting, the agenda question of a military demarcation line has yet to be settled. At Khe Song, Admiral Joy and General Craigie hope to meet the Reds on more amiable terms. They are in for a rude shock. In direct violation of the terms laid down for the truce talks, the communists have unaccountably permitted a unit of 83 Chinese soldiers in full battle dress to enter the neutral area. Fully armed with mortars, rifles, pistols, and submachine guns, they make their camp within full view of the conference headquarters. An allied photographer is threatened away by the commander of the Red Unit. The shortest session to date was terminated by Admiral Joy after seven minutes during which he accused the Reds of the violation. An empty conference room symbolizes the gulf between communism and democracy. Admiral Joy reports the neutrality violation to General Ridgway. The UN negotiators are called back to Tokyo. General Na Miel, with a sheepish smile, apologizes for the incident. After the meeting with General Ridgway in Tokyo, negotiations are resumed. A possible subject for discussion, a change of sight for the truce talks.